Hello, MB Poly world. We are back for another week, and this week we're doing one of our favorite topics. We've done it a number of times. We are doing housing. I would be remiss if we didn't say that we are here on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq, the Paskatomakati, as well as the Wollastook. And we are here in Menaquist or St. John. Uh, happy to come back to you for another week. I am obviously here solo, uh, missing my intrepid partner, in crime for this podcast, Joanna, who just is not going to be able to make it this week. But we have a great guest that we are excited to talk to. Um, we had a millennial moron who goes by a pseudonym. Um, and uh, millennial moron has multiple accounts. And I stumbled upon uh, his, the, his account, I want to say it would have been late 2020. Two, it could have been early 2023, but it's been a while now that I've been watching content after content about the Canadian real estate and housing crisis and these incred incredible examples of properties that compare uh, across different jurisdictions, across some of the, the like, um, that's between countries, say, like a, a house for sale in Canada selling for, uh, you know, a quarter as much for a similar sized place in a different place and so that has been really good to see but also more recently uh diving into policy issues diving into other stuff and so we're here to kind of grab a bit of a national look at what we're seeing unfold for housing and so i am stoked to jump in there let me bring him in here we are millennial moron welcome back to the show hi thanks for having me back yeah we're we're jazzed to do it uh, you and I were just having a chat about some of the things uh, that we could jump into before this. So I wanted to jump right into it for our listeners because we've been touting about the housing crisis. And, you know, certainly I've been uh, on this bandwagon of uh, really pushing back against the idea of small reforms needed and moving into a more transformative replacement theory of our housing system and we haven't really gone into all those details in our previous podcast we have talked about housing a lot and we have just had a major new a new budget with major new initiatives on housing so before we get to the framing question that we chatted about what what grabbed you the most about what came down the pipeline recently from the federal government around the housing initiatives or funding? Um, it's hard to pick out anything specific. I mean, it is a lot of small things. Um, one of the things I feel most po positively about, um, which is a policy that I've advocated before, is the idea of using public land to build housing. Mm. Um, and I've, I've been doing you know, more research about what is done in other cities, uh, you know, in other countries, on other continents. And one of the major things is in one way or another, they are leveraging public land as an asset uh, to put towards making housing more affordable or more secure for more people. So I think that's one of the good ideas. I think as far as the implementation goes, uh, the, the numbers that they have attached to that are are pretty weak. Um, they were saying they want to build something like 30,000 homes on public land over the next five years with 6,000 of them being affordable which really compared to the scale of uh, household formation that we've seen recently is, uh, is quite small, you know, it's a drop in the bucket, but it is conceptually a very powerful tool that we can use. So I'm happy to see them go ahead with that. So when they say like, like converting public land and, you know, going after, I do believe I heard the minister, uh, Minister Frazier refer to this in an interview. It might've been with Peter Mansbridge. It could have been on one of the major news outlets, but, they started making reference to lazy land, um, whether that be municipal land that's that's sitting idle or provincial or federal. What is it that they're framing to us here for using public land to build? Is that selling it to developers? Is it incentives to build on for nonprofits? Uh, I guess help us understand, because even on this pod, I guess for like clarification, we haven't done a deep dive into digesting the federal housing budget and which really this budget is a housing budget for most of its highlight issues um capital gains obviously is getting some attention but but yeah what are the what are you what do you think they're spelling out here for how they plan to to free up some of this quote-unquote lazy land 
Yeah, so the plan was obviously very light on the detail, so it's hard to do a deep dive into the nitty gritty of it because it's still, you know, programs that are being developed essentially. But that is a big contrast between uh, the, the plan being pitched by the conservatives right now versus the one that the liberals have just released in the budget. Um, the conservatives have said outright that they want to sell the land for development, mm. whereas the liberals have, in one way or another, it seems like they're going to go ahead with something where the government or the public retains ownership over the land and it's used for housing. Um, it right. seems to, they don't seem to be um, pitching an idea for public housing at least not at this time, uh, or at least not integrated with that plan. Uh, but it seems more like they would be leasing either existing buildings or vacant land or underused land uh, to, again, they haven't been specific about it, but it could be you know NGOs, it could be nonprofits, it could be private developers who find some kind of business case for it. But it seems like the idea is to take this asset, which we own, which is land, mm -hmm. and it forms in many cities a major component of the cost of housing. And so we'll say instead of you know selling it off and taking the cash and trying to build housing with it, we'll just take the land we already have. We will let people use it for cheap or for free. Not sure yet. Mm. Yep. Uh, and have them build housing on it and basically remove the, remove the land costs from that housing and attach the condition of the lease to having to use it for housing that meets certain affordab affordability criteria. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you're right, that is pretty substantial, and there is a difference here between how the conservatives seem to be. And it's funny, because, like, as much as people will say, holy smokes, Justin Trudeau's toast, you know, the liberals are toast, and they don't have anything to stand on. At the same time, what I find interesting here is it was only three months ago, you know, well, maybe four months ago now, I'm trying to remember, but Pierre Polyev came out with his 15-minute cartoon TED Talk there on housing. And he was like seen as the, you know, the only one who was trying to do any major work on the file and to expose the blind spots and the problems and all this. And, and now it really does seem to have like the tables have turned. It's early stages. We haven't seen any polling uh, information, but it is, this is an inherently political difference. And they're trying to at least bring some sort of difference, a wedge between them and the conservatives and the other parties um and so i guess when when you look at this budget and when you look at what the liberals are announcing for the next year and a bit basically um pretty confident the government's not going to fall anytime soon um do you think and this leads us to our framing question that maybe we can bat back and forth do you think that it is, as the commentators say, that this is going to start the trajectory of making housing a possibility for millennials? I mean, that's our generation. Millennial moron, that's your, that is, uh, obviously, I would, I would think you're a part of the millennial generation, um, as I am. But of course, that's what the commentators are saying, that this is a budget that is fixed on making things possible for millennials and and the younger folks, um, Gen Alpha and others. Do you think we have the ingredients here? And do you think the liberals have a wedge that they can run with? Uh, no. <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's woefully insufficient what's being proposed by either federal party, but also at the same time, uh, this is not just an issue that can be solved by the federal government, right? You need mm. all levels of government, federal, provincial, and municipal, all pulling in the same direction and all working within their respective scope, you know, their jurisdiction towards the same goal. And at the same time, I think there is a cultural shift that needs to happen um, as a, you know, as a broad society, we generally view housing very much as an investment, yep. even your primary residence. I think we talked about this last time, but, you know, people focus on it so much as this big financial decision that we've really lost sight of, you know what's what are our values as a society do we value being able to make money off of housing over having secure housing for the vast majority of the population or or is it the other way around you know um, we have to decide what's important to us and then i guess work that into what our expectations of politicians are and you know we can contrast the plans of the two parties but i think what's really important for people to get at is look into the policies for yourself don't just 
pick a side and say, I'm going to support everything this side says and reject everything the other side says. You know, if, if you want to change in the federal government, which, you know, I think is reasonable, I think they're a little bit overdue to be, uh, to be a little long in the tooth in the, yeah, in my opinion, uh, you know, I think they've had several scandals that would have sunk any previous government to be yeah, honest I know, with you, it's but, true. but it's become so, uh, hyper polarized and so partisan that people are often voting against who they don't want to get in. Yeah. I think, you know, one way or the other, what we need to do is look and see which policies are good, which ones are going to help us and which ones are bad and are only going to make things worse either now or down the line and pressure whatever government is in power at all levels to support mm. the good ones and to actually put the weight of their power as a government behind it. You know, for example, I say that, you know, selling land, I think is a bad idea because it's, you know, it might free up a little bit of cash right now, but it doesn't give you longer term control over that asset. Yeah. And so it may become an issue another 50 years down the line when we're facing another budget or another housing crisis. You know, we have lost control of an asset that we could have leveraged in a different way. Um, but it doesn't mean that, you know, if you want to keep control of that land, like you have to vote for the liberals or that, you know, if you vote for the conservatives, you have to go along with their plan to sell it. Right. right. Like just tell the government, whoever it is, we want to keep this land because it's an important important asset and yeah. just selling it off is, is selling ourselves down the river in the future. And I think I can give you, uh, I can give a good example here uh, from something that happened in St. John in New Brunswick here. That's, that's probably something you're familiar with. Um, and then I want to get your thoughts on, on the old burr techniques that investors use to buy, renovate, refinance, redo, re, you know, repeat thing. But we saw recently a couple of years ago, uh, a company called Hazen uh, Investments, and and it, was it Hazen Investments? Was that the name of it? Hazen Properties. Anyway, they had a number of buildings, and many of these buildings they had had for decades, and a number of them were sitting mortgage free. The family that managed that, the older gentleman that runs that, uh, that ran that, he ran it well. The buildings were well maintained, and he. Um, looked after his tenants by all by all senses of the word like there really well a lot of people that were uh, a, a quote unquote a fan of their landlord and that's pretty rare to see but there were a lot of people disappointed when the family decided that they didn't want to continue on with their property company management company and and holding company and put a number of these buildings on the market they didn't put all of their buildings on the market they kind of reduced the portfolio and so hundreds of units is that ended up getting sold to another company here, Historica. And Historica, again, decent reputation, but definitely on that high end. And of course, these buildings are sitting mortgage-free. And the rents really have been stable for years. And even then this happened during the kind of the in the middle of the of the crazy um inflation airy kind of pressure time as well as when real estate just got really hot and nine ten offers on you know small houses never mind big buildings like this and you have to and what happens of course is historica gets this they buy it and they get it from hazen and and historica promises immediately not to raise the rents on tenants that are there um which of course is not possible because this new mortgage sits on a building that didn't have one before and it has the same property taxes and so the, it only has gone up the carrying cost of this building has gone up for somebody and even if they want even if all they did was wanted to make a hundred dollars a year profit on each unit which is not what i'm sure they wanted to do but even if they were really benevolent like that you can't help the fact that this building has now gone from something that could have been affordable to something that has to be unaffordable given the new carrying costs. Like uh, when you talk about public land, my mind goes there. Like a lot of the initiatives I saw in this federal budget anyway, and some of the initiatives, they're going to take three to five years before we see any, any of the evidence of them having an impact or, or starting to work. 
But the reality is, you know, if all we do is sell off public land or give it away, whoever, unless we're giving it to the nonprofit sector, we stand, a ch we, we don't stand a good chance of maintaining the affordability of that building uh, long term. And, and I think this is something that, you know, I talk to a lot of people who are very much like, no, it's regulation. That's the problem. It's red tape. It's municipalities. It's zoning. It's all this. This is the problem for housing and why it's so expensive. And I look at this example and I say, can you tell me how the market hasn't created just a egregious coordination failure here for our housing system? Um, so I think I, I agree with what you're saying. We have we have to hold on to that land to protect its long-term value to us. Do you think, I mean, you're, you're monitoring a lot about what's happening in Calgary and you've, you've watched about what's happened in other places. Do you think people are starting to get the idea that the market, that capitalism is maybe not the best tool to manage this portfolio? I think there are quite a few people who are starting to get that, but also at the same time, uh, I think there's a lot of people who have made a lot of money in housing and, um, you know, have been for many years just going along with this idea that housing is a completely bulletproof investment um, and almost that they're entitled to a profit on it, which is causing a lot of resentment in, you know, not only the fact that they're having a hard time making a profit now, but in any suggestion that housing should become even more affordable, right? Like I, I've seen many, many, and a smaller time property investors say, you know, well, we have to raise rent this high because interest rates have gone up and there's no other way to get around this problem. Um, in my opinion, that's just you overpaid for the property and you made a bad investment on an assumption that your interest rate was going to be, you know, below Stagnant. inflation or, or, you know, at the level of inflation forever. So you're basically borrowing yeah. money for free. But that's not really a business plan to just say, I've based my entire business on carrying huge debt loads, and I assume they're going to be cheap forever, right? Um, so I, I think that, like, it's, it's really hard to say what exactly to do, but um, I don't think that regulation should be overly sensitive to protecting people's profits when we're in really a major transition economically from a long-term low interest rate environment to kind of the end of the era of free money. You know, we, yeah, we had, I, yeah. I heard uh, George Monbiot not long ago talk about, uh, he wrote a book, um, politics in an age of crisis. And he talked about the, the you know, the, the collapse of neoliberalism and the ideology there. And for our listeners who don't know what neoliberalism is, it's totally, totally fine. You'll kind of piece it together as we, kind of chat about it here because you're talking about some of that but one of the things george momby it says was like the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s were built on this idea that capital is mobile it can go wherever it needs to go it can take advantage of cheap labor in places like bangladesh or mexico if it needs to it can benefit from cheap energy that we have from oil which is you know there's the uh, global market that has saturated and become efficient at you know, generating energy through oil, and it can um, capitalize on cheap debt. And, you know, anybody who lived through the 80s and bought a house knows you paid 19% interest rates, but for a $40,000 price tag, um, $80,000 price tag, and, and anybody now, you know, we haven't seen interest rates above 7.5%. And yet we're losing our minds because we've just built this like culture around cheap debt i like what you say there like the idea that landlords have built a business plan around a foolish proposition yeah and i think in many ways a lot of the economy right now is built on that same foolish proposition right um having interest of, or you know having debt available to you at a cost that is at or below inflation actually means it makes sense to pay almost any amount for basically a, a real asset or mm. whatever, right? So um, the main lever that central banks have to try to, you know, spur the economy or slow it down is the, the policy interest rate. Yeah. And, you know, after the financial crisis in 2008, there was a lot of uncertainty. A lot of people didn't want to invest. 
And so they made interest rates very, very low to give a lot of people access to a lot of capital to invest. But because interest rates were so low and kept falling, people started moving money or moving their investments out of productive capital, like say, mm -hmm. you know, machinery, worker training, salaries, whatever, right? Manufacturing. Like things, that actually, yeah. things that actually produce stuff. Yeah. Uh, and into unproductive assets such as real estate, you know, in that same time period. And, and again, this has been going on for decades. Real mm -hmm. estate rental and leasing grew to be the largest sector of the Canadian economy. And when did that happen? I've been talking about that too. I've been talking about that for at least two years now. And I remember somebody put me on to that and I was like, like, yeah, real estate and leasing is not construction even. And it, yeah, if you're in construction, it's it, a lot more. And construction is in fourth place. And, you know, real estate and leasing is just an industry that decides how we distribute property and who gets paid what for distributing shelter. Like it's, it's a bit of a, a strange um, industry to have as your number one GDP earner. And I couldn't find another G7. I know I might be putting you on the spot. So feel free to say, I, I don't know when this happened. But I did some quick looks and I mean, I went back and I found something that was half decently understandable from 1985 and certainly real estate and leasing was like number seven on the list mm -hmm. around then. So it wasn't, you know, in the 80s, obviously. And I couldn't find another G7 country like Canada who had real estate and leasing as its number one industry. And so I'm just thinking to myself, like, when, when did this happen for us? And like, how did it happen? And, and I think to myself, like five years ago, seven years ago, a lot of us were watching HGTV and, you know, flip my house and this old house and house flippers, like all over the place on TLC and all these channels. And it was an obsession, like it was very popular. And I'm like, we were literally watching the cancer grow in our society by watching those shows. Like we were just watching this disease get celebrated and proliferate and get a bunch of people attracted to the idea of taking an affordable asset and making it something that was expensive. Um, and we didn't even stop to consider how it was going to run people over eventually. So I don't know if you have thoughts on that, but like you're, you're one of the very few people I've heard mention that industry, like that industry specific. Yeah, I've been meaning to do a, uh, a video or at least put together a spreadsheet on this, but it, it was quite some time ago, at least 15 years ago. Um, okay. I, or, you know, it, in that vicinity, right? It might have been, you know, 14 or something. I, I don't sure. know off the top of my head, but it's been a while, right? And it happened as interest rates kept falling, which inflates the value of all these assets. And so as we went through this really long period where they were trying to spur investment into the economy and instead spurred investment into real assets... Uh, you know, people on paper were making lots and lots of money. Um, mm. and But in this process of making a lot of money, uh, we lost something of value, which is having a society where people had access to either home ownership or to, you know, stable, affordable rental arrangements. Um, yep. And I think really the, the really big flip has happened as interest rates went back up, which is the, the risk that I've been concerned about for years and years is what happens when when that Interest finally happens, it's inevitable, right? Mm -hmm. And we have more and more, you know, our, our debt has been ballooning and ballooning at all levels, like at, at the government level, at the household level, uh, both mortgage and non-mortgage debt. And, you know, what happens to both asset prices and, uh, you know, household disposable income when so much more of their income starts getting sucked up by debt service payments. And really what I thought was going to happen uh, at that point was that, I figured a lot of these smaller landlords who basically predicated their whole business on cheap debt and were doing the the Burr method that you talk about where yeah, they read which they read which dad poor dad. Yeah, constantly re-leveraging <laughs> your assets to buy more and just take out more debt. Yeah. And you know, they've got their whole business leveraged five to one. Uh, I thought a lot of those people were going to get washed out because, you know, something I try to remind people of is that uh, you know, people always say landlords will not rent to you for less than whatever it costs to own the property, which, you know, in normal times is true, but the market cannot support infinite rent either, right? You know, if rent was $100,000 a month, people wouldn't be able to pay it. 
yeah. right? That's very even obvious. if that's even if that's what the building cost to maintain. Yeah. yeah. So my my assumption was that when interest rates went up, landlords would start competing with each other, and you know, it would drive rents. Uh, well, you know, it would either stabilize rents, but it would basically wash out people who were over leveraged, right? Mm. But uh, as it turns out, this coincided with historically low vacancy rates at the same time. Right. So landlords really don't have to compete for tenants. And so they can basically put rents to whatever they want. But in places like Toronto, we're starting to see the cracks forming in that is, that, you know, there's another layer beyond that is that if people can't afford their rent, then they can't pay it. Right. But it, well, I, I was, I, a, I, it's, a, it's a heavily regulated industry. Right. Yeah. And so now if people aren't paying their rent, they have the right to a landlord tenant board hearing. And now the landlord tenant board has gotten so backed up in Ontario that it takes a year to get a hearing. And wow. so now the landlords, but the, but the landlords the are the ones property. that are miss. Yeah. But the landlords in Ontario are the ones that are missing out. Right. When those meetings can't happen, just run that by me again so that I'm not misunderstanding because I, I think if I'm hearing you right in Ontario, if I can't pay my rent, uh, or all of it or whatever it is. And like, what is the process for eviction? What is the process for review look like there? Because I think we have the absolute opposite situation in New Brunswick, but I just want to understand, I want to make sure I understand properly. It's basically that, you know, if you're evicting someone for cause, they have the right to a hearing. And if the hearing is backed up, then you can't actually physically kick them out of the property until uh, they have a hearing. hearing, right? And so if that's a year and you're the landlord and you've got no income coming in and you have to carry the cost of that property or possibly multiple properties at these higher interest rates, like you're bleeding money really, really quickly. So in that sense, you know, they've kind of played an Uno reverse card. I, I imagine the whole system will figure out a way to deal with it eventually. Like it can't right. go on forever like this. And, and some tenants are, uh, you know, you might have heard of cash for keys where People are saying, yes. well, well, just buy me out of the lease, right? And that, and that happens, you know, both for people who are uh, withholding rent and they're, you know, kind of trying to put pressure on the landlord to buy them out of the lease. Um, but it also happens with people who are um, in good standing on their rent, right? Like I've uh, seen stories, um, I believe CBC it was, but they, they had, you know, basically a few people on there with different sob stories. And one was somebody who had, bought a second property as kind of their retirement plan. And now they were trying to cash out of it. Um, but they had a tenant in there who was paying their rent on time and they had sold it with a condition that the tenant had to be gone by the time the new owner took possession of the property. Um, but the tenant said, well, you know, I don't want to move out too bad. Um, yep. So, you know, I'm going to keep paying rent, but, I'm going to ask for a hearing from the landlord tenant board. And now, meanwhile, this person who wants to cash out for their retirement, uh, they, they basically can't get the person out of there. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, the person offered, you know, pay me whatever tens of thousands of dollars to move out and find another place. Because obviously they're going to have to go on short notice, look for another place to live in an extremely Enough. tight market, right? Yeah, yeah. So they're perfectly within their rights to try and make that negotiation. In fact, like they don't have to make a cash for keys offer, right? No. They could just say, well, too bad. I'm going to stay here until we have the hearing. So in that sense, they're actually being nicer to the landlord than they have to by offering to negotiate in that way. And I think they did end up like settling outside of any binding oh, arbitration sure. about that, right? They just ended up buying the tenant out and selling the property. But yeah, like that, that's the kind of regulatory risk. Um, you know, there's the interest rate risk. And then there's also that regulatory risk that a lot of people completely failed to price into their investment. And now they're saying, you know, it's it's not fair. But, and you know, they're saying this isn't how a legitimate business works. But, you know, if you've ever done any dealings with contracts and business, this is exactly how business works. Like people will pull any lever they can when things are going badly to, yep. to try and get out of the deal as best they can for themselves. Yep. And that includes like leveraging any kind of legislation or legal processes they can use. Oh, I mean, I uh, I didn't get paid twelve thousand dollars on a job from somebody uh, that I did an entire basement rental for, so I put a lien on their house. Yeah, that's how business works. Exactly. I wasn't paid. 
I had their opportunity to go into the courthouse and pay a small fee to take a lien out on the house. They had to challenge that in court. I was happy to do it. They didn't do that. They paid me. And, and so like, I agree. And I often think of this as like landlords are the laziest type of business owners. Like they, they don't, they couldn't run another business if they needed to, because the, the principles that they can build a business on for real estate leasing and things like that and rentals are so obtuse to the rest of how business works and, and stupid. Like it's just, it's an, it's amazing, but I, we do absolutely have the opposite situation in New Brunswick. And this is something for our more local listeners. Um, you know, it's funny. I heard uh, a politics podcast, the curse of politics uh, talk about New Brunswick being one of the last provinces where, um, where campaign uh, financing or not campaign financing, sorry, like donations to political campaigns was like the wild west because you can take, you can get donations from anywhere in the country and there's no, there's no problem. Like you can be in BC and donate to a candidate and it's not. And in many provinces, that's not the case. Uh, donations can only come from residents uh, and things like that, but it's the same here for our residential tribunal, um, our RTT and the residential tenancy tribunal, sorry, the RTT. If, if I don't pay my rent, if I can't pay my rent, I don't have an option to ask for a hearing. My landlord is within their right to file and have a sheriff come into my house within 60 days and arrest me and take me out of here. It is a completely messed up situation. And we have, we're coming into an election year. Like we have no protections, like very few protections. There's no rent caps. Um, you know, we have the high in St. John, actually, we have the highest rent increases year over year of anywhere in the country. And I mean, our rents are relatively low compared to Toronto rents, right? Like, for example, I, you know, I've got four kids, I've got a bunch of kids and I live in this place. And, you know, we pay a fair bit, but a four bedroom house is still right around $2,500, $2,900, a house on a plot of land. There's not a lot of houses for it, but there's a few. And, you know, you can get a two bedroom apartment for $1,600, $1,400. Those are really low on a national average. I realize that. But we also have some of the lowest median household incomes. Um, so even, even still a lot of people here are paying more than I certainly am, uh, paying more than 35, 40% of their earnings on shelter, which creates just so much fragility as we know. Um, and I'm not convinced that the government, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not convinced that the feds have done any regulatory work here to improve this situation. Like the way I see it is investors and you know passive income bros as some of them call them and some of these folks on that are just obsessed with trying to make you know a pretty penny on real estate they're going to get frustrated with uh some of the smaller cities that in ontario and bc and alberta that have been hot and they're going to see st john with you know we have less than a one percent vacancy rate we have a zero percent vacancy rate on new builds um and they're and, and you know the average house still here is going to sell for three hundred thousand dollars. I fear that we're in it for the long haul. Like we're in it until we catch up to Halifax and Montreal and and some of these other jurisdictions. Like it, uh, but I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Like maybe there's something. Maybe we're seeing some glimmers of hope um, in the regulation of this. I mean, it seems like the federal liberals want to skip the provinces and rein some of this in. But what do you think? Ah, well, that was, uh, there, there was a lot to cover there. Um, yes. Yeah. They're sorry. I went, went long yeah. went all over the place. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the way I see it is that a lot of these rental protections that we talk about as though they're solutions, they're more like stopgap measures, right? Like rent control, especially the way they do it in Ontario, right? It's controlled through the tenancy, but not between tenants. Right. Mm. So when you switch over to a new tenant, you can charge as much as you want. So really what that does is it kind of, if you're in a chronic shortage, um, it just distorts the market, right? Because 
you end up having new tenants coming in and having to pay more to cover the people who've been in a place for a long time that the, the landlord can't get rid of. Um, fundamentally, I think what we need to do is balance the supply and the demand in the market to the point where people have a choice in where they choose to live, right? Yeah. Like if you imagine St. John, let's say 10, 15 years ago, I, I don't know how long you've lived in St. John, but mm -hmm. that long. Not, um, not quite that long, but you know, I've been around St. John for that long for sure. Okay. So I would imagine, and you know, I don't even have the stats on this, but I would imagine that when you first moved to St. John, you probably had, you know, you could go find a new apartment relatively easily and it wasn't that expensive. There would probably be multiple places that would fit into your Oh budget, yeah. It was like right? a five, it was really bad actually. In 2015, the vacancy rate in St. John residentially, uh, cause St. John has this crazy story, but New Brunswick is similar enough. Moncton and Fredericton similar enough, but we, you know, as cities, we had resting vacancy rates around 4% and St. John was like, oh, like 8% at one point in time. It was really high. Yeah. And so, and I mean, we talk about 8% as though it's comically high, but uh, you know, there's other places in Canada that have experienced that and haven't, you know, been in really dire straits. It's just a matter of, you know, there's some units that are vacant and the rest kind of carry the cost. But the thing is, if you're in that kind of situation, you don't really need that many rental protections, do you? Like you're, you're if right. you paid your rent on time every month, your landlord wasn't going to kick you out. They need the money and you need the place to live. So it's a good business arrangement. Now, on the other hand, if you're a tenant who is in a rent controlled unit and it's an extremely tight market and the landlord could potentially make a big profit by kicking you out and getting somebody else in there, they're going to try and do that in any way that they can, right? Like mm. I've had friends who had landlords try to evict them for totally ridiculous reasons. Like one was saying they damaged the windows, but what they had put up was like those vinyl, like Halloween decoration stickers that are totally removable. It's just like, you know, they put them up for the holiday because yeah. their kids thought it was fun. And it's just like no damage to the unit, but it was basically, it just became like almost a running joke where, you know, every time the landlord would visit, they would drop off some other reason why they needed to evict them. Right. But but they couldn't because none of the reasons were legitimate, but mm. they kept trying. So the thing is, if you've got that, um, you know, kind of stable, balanced vacancy rate, if you have enough housing for the population, if people have a choice as tenants of, you know, which landlords to choose between, landlords still have to compete a bit, it isn't that necessary to have all these built-in protections. Um, now, at the same time, I think what the federal government is doing is they're not so much trying to do an end run around provinces and establish rent controls, but I think some of, and this is just a hunch I have, some of what's right. contained in the budget uh, is aimed at enabling provinces to implement stronger rent controls if they choose to do so. Mm. So, for example, one of the big things that uh, was in the budget, and Apparently, there's been a mechanism to do this forever, and most people just don't use it, but they've been talking about using rental history to um, to build a credit score, right? Yeah, and you know so, what? I've, I've, I've seen companies that do this, like Chexy, that already like have a workaround so that you can use your credit card to pay your rent, and it gets reported on Equifax. So that, yeah. when I saw that, I'm like, are they just saying that companies like Chexy who offer this service for a small fee are now like out of the gray and into the light or green? Like, how does that? I think that they're also calling on like the major banks and, you know, I guess like right. fintech places like Chexy or whatever. They're, they're calling on them to start doing that and uh, basically have a more mainstream system for doing it and raise awareness that it's a possibility. Now, that that's one thing, right, is... Mm being able to build a credit score and get access to lots and lots of debt and be a good Canadian and bury yourself. <laughs> as much as you <laughs> but another thing it does, and this ties into what they've been talking about of making sure landlords report um, like previous rental rates for the property. I think yeah, what they're doing, that's is substantial. They're, they're starting to build a database and a paper trail of what rent has been paid. Right. And I, I find often with this government, they do things like incrementally by degree um, mm. and they kind of build the data set first and then implement something or, you know, would spur the provinces to implement something like good old technocrat or yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, beyond that, they also, I'm sure have an issue with um, like landlords 
not reporting rent or under reporting rent on their taxes, right. To try mm -hmm. and save some money. And they didn't really have that good of a system to monitor that before. But now if you've got um, tenants self-reporting and you give them an incentive to do that, then of course they're going to say, okay, I've been paying this much for this property and I want to get that on my credit score. And now the banks have access to that information and they potentially have a way, you know, if they're saying landlords have to report previous rental rates for the same unit, um, you know, a lot of people ridiculed that because they're saying, well, tenants have no power to negotiate, so they can't use this to negotiate their rent anyway. But they're building a system where you have to report what you're bringing in. Yep. You're supposed to report that on your income taxes. And they also are going to have, you know, some auditable paper trail through major banks to do that, right? So it enables the potential for stronger rent controls. And in Quebec, they actually already have a system to do that. Um, landlords are supposed to report what the previous, uh, like what the lowest rental rate in the last 12 months was. And if you move into a new apartment and you know what the rent was before, you actually have something like, uh, like 30 or 60 days to file um, a complaint with their like residential tenancy board. I forget exactly what it's called, but um, that you can say like this rent increase is unreasonable, even though it wasn't applied just to me, you know, it's, they've increased the rent too much over last year to this year. Right. So there is a mechanism there to get your rent adjusted. Now, I think a lot of people are still scared to do it because they don't want to get into a fight with their landlord when the market is so tight, but. Yeah, but you're right. Yeah. It gives the potentials because I mean, we've looked at a landlord registry here in the city of St. John. I want to say we, not our staff, a few of us counselors, we've looked at some of these options because we looked at the Quebec model mm -hmm. and we said, okay, well, what if you had a registry of some sort that had sort of a benchmark that you could score against and sort of an open source, you know, um, interface that allowed people to see this in more real time. And we actually have a group here in the province that has done some of this work. And what they, they did is they hired two or three people. I can't remember how many they hired. Um, it's the New Brunswick Nonprofit Housing Association. As they hired some folks to scrub Kijiji and Facebook Marketplace. And what, they didn't necessarily have the ability to compare one, one unit to the same unit the next year because there wasn't a high enough turnover. What they did was they started in 2022. Uh, in 2021, and they, and they went till the start of 2024, and mostly just in rural New Brunswick, not even in the urban centers. And what they did was they said, okay, here's a three bedroom in Bucktouche, New Brunswick. Here's another three bedroom in Bucktouche, New Brunswick with a similar square footage. And they started categorizing it based on bedrooms and amenities into a really like simple version, basically a, you know, a, a one drive with different like locations and bedrooms. And they saw like a pretty straight uh, increase all the way along. And so you can kind of see, like you say, the framework here being built out to rein that type of predatorial activity in. Yeah. And like I said, this wouldn't be the first time that they've done that sort of thing. I just think a lot of people don't realize that that's potentially what they're doing here. Like right in, in 2016, uh, they introduced a requirement with, you know, no other associated actions, but they said, if you sell your primary residence, you have to report it to the CRA, like what the property was and what you sold it for. Mm. They didn't make any tax changes, but it seemed pretty obvious they were going to do some kind of tinkering with the exemption for capital gains tax on your primary residence. And then, you know, years later, it was just a year or two ago, they introduced the the flipper tax, right? Yeah. And so they spent whatever that would have been, eight years building a data set and building um, basically an expectation that you would have reported that on your taxes and make sure, you know, everyone's aware of it. Because if you implement both things at the same time, people are going to be like, oh, I didn't know I had to report it. That's and right. now I owe like a $50,000 tax bill on this property that I flipped in a year. And now I'm going to complain to CBC Marketplace about it or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, they, they make it, you know, you have eight years to figure it out. And now we're going to implement this this tax um and that's i think the same kind of thing that's happening here um i noticed you got like a, a camo hoodie on are you a, a hunter i am uh right. for sure so yeah. another example of this you might have noticed is um with uh 
like non-restricted firearms transfers yes like have you heard about that how now when if, two if i wanted to wanna give sell if i wanted to give to, a rifle yeah. to somebody yet yeah. yeah they have to um like go to the rcmp database and get a, a transfer number between two people or something yes and th this is, comes after like a decade after the long gun registry was scrapped yeah right so they they're laying groundwork for potentially they could just add another box that says, okay, you have to put in the, the serial number as well. Right. right. So they could be potentially building that data set for a new. So you're saying rate. some of these crazy guys that are saying that the government's coming for our guns are right. Well, I mean, they may just be <laughs> trying to reestablish the registry, right? Yeah, I think that's right. It's yeah, like, I, th I think, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a it's dumb, I mean, it's, it's a trope. <laughs> sure. But if, the government is starting to collect a bunch of new information. Yeah, it's reasonable to expect they are doing something with that information. Yeah, they plan. There's some plan there, and I, you know, I see that stuff too. And I'm like, I think that's bureaucratic. I don't think that's political. I think there's just, you know, people within the bureaucracy that are kind of grinding their own axes and and you know, trying to it, like it. Just I see it in our own staff. It's like there is such a disconnect from what what is possible and what is likely between at policy levels. Like I, you know, I do all this work to try to understand, you know, how do you build a unitary housing market? How do you build that system that Vienna has or Tokyo has or other jurisdictions have that, or even American cities, there's certain American cities that have it. Um, the high rates of nonprofit, non-market ownership and, how that creates such resiliency and, and health and the system and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you can know all the right information. You can see the evidence for it. And yet those, the, the bureaucracy that is behind all this, and not that I think anybody's evil, but the bureaucracy is so obsessed with its own methodology and approach um, that yeah, you know, when I see things like that being trotted out, it's like I don't think a politician sat down or a you know a policy expert sat down and gave this. As, um, I think, I think somebody is just like we're going to need this eventually. Let's start collecting data on it and convincing politicians that it's worthwhile to do so, right? But I don't know. I don't. It's it's hard not to be cynical around some of this. Yeah, and I think a lot of the actions that get taken here are more in the vein of being seen to be doing something than actually doing something about yeah, the issue. Fair. Like I said, there, there are cultural changes that need to happen, right? Like you, you brought up uh, Tokyo. I actually visited Tokyo recently. It's, it's very fascinating to see like large, large areas of kind of mid-rise buildings. And mm. it, it is a city that's, that's quite affordable for people to live in, um, whether they want to buy or they want to rent. Uh, and it's, it's very different from a lot of the European cities that you mentioned. Like, you know, there, there's Vienna or... Um, like Paris, they've been doing more with public housing, subsidized housing. Uh, London has been doing that as well. Uh, whereas Tokyo, really, they just, uh, I think the easiest way to put it is they don't have a concept of nimbyism in their culture. No, like there's no they're there's, very compliant. <laughs> well, there's like a, a thing of compliance, but there's also just no expectation that you should have uh, the ability to veto what your neighbor is doing with their property, right? Yeah. It's like you- Collectivism, yeah. Yeah, you bought the thing that you bought and that's what you have control over. If somebody else, you know, down the street wants to put up a, a three or four story apartment building, that's their business. And, you know, your mm. property is your business. And so they have enormous amounts of, uh, of housing stock, right? And mm. it's pretty much all market housing as, as far as I've learned from my research. I don't think they have that much in the way of subsidized or public housing. But it's still very, very affordable just because yeah. they have people kind of build whatever they want. Um, in contrast, um, as, as I mentioned before the call, I've been covering the, the Calgary Affordable Housing Plan for a while because, you know, they started it. It's a really great example of seeing the whole process through. And I've been looking at yeah. it, uh, maybe a year now. Um, and right now they are holding public hearings on basically changing the base res residential zone in the city um from rc1 which is single detached homes or you know rc2 which is duplex also very common in the city mm -hmm. uh to something that they call rcg which is you know it has to be contextual within the neighborhood that it's in 
but it allows still low density residential up to a maximum of row housing. Um, so you might be able to put like four units where you had a bungalow before. Right. And they have, you know, obviously there's there's an opportunity for secondary suites and things like that as well. Um, and, and of course, that's not going to change the city overnight. Um, it's not even that drastic of a change in terms of density. Uh, it, you know, if you have inner city neighborhoods and row housing starts going in, it's not that surprising, right? What you see no. there currently is that the zoning doesn't change. They just, if developers want to make a profit off it, they still can. They just build a gigantic single detached infill home. Mm-hmm. Um, and that still has all the same issues with like setbacks and design and changing the character of the neighborhood and shadowing and whatever. Uh, it's just less people can live there. But it's a great example. I, I actually just brought a motion to our council not long ago calling for all, which zones now that I narrow it down to, um, basically all commercial zones to be also residential commercial so that there was no because we don't have actually plan sj our municipal plan would be it sounds to me anyway and it looks like calgary specifically like we're quite a ways ahead we don't have a lot of exclusionary zoned areas where you have to build a single family detached home but we have a lot of commercial districts where in order for residential stuff to be built on it or an apartment building it has to be rezoned to RC, residential commercial. Mm. Um, and and so we've seen we've seen some weird stuff here where uh, you know, for example, a buyer from BC comes and flies, they don't even come into town. They buy a, a lot that's zoned um, R2, which is as you say, duplexes mostly, um, or single family detached or fine too. And they they bought this, they it was in a bit of a, a strange area. It was the clear neighborhood. So it was near some bigger commercial buildings and whatnot. And they rezoned it to residential commercial so they could um, get approval for a 85 unit apartment building. Well, everything went good. They delivered the drawings. They got approved at um, PAC. They got approved at council. And they just turned around and sold the rezoned plot for five times what they bought it. Mm -hmm. And that level of speculation was new to us. I was leery of it. But you basically had somebody that moved capital around in a way who they didn't, they didn't even have to come set foot in our city. And the process of one, desperation. And I think if we can kind of end on this topic, I guess is a good little segue here. Like you're talking about Tokyo and saying, well, look, they just have basically dezoned a lot of areas and said, build what you need to build what you want and had a lot of inclusionary zoning policies. Um, and that's worked for them. But do we really think that the market can correct itself? Because to avoid this stuff like this speculation and this easy money that can be made on stuff like this. When, as long as there's a shortage of housing, there is money to be made. And it seems like a lot of money to be made. Like, do we really think the market can do that? Or, you know, and you've talked about this a little bit, are we going to need to see provinces who are the main, you know, constitutional body here for housing step up to, to challenge this? Yeah, I, I do think there's going to have to be at least some kind of, you know, regulatory changes or government putting forth more effort to actually get things built. Because as you said, you know, there's there's no guarantee that the private sector is going to go through with it. Um, and, and as I was saying earlier, I do really think that there is an important cultural change that will need to happen to seeing uh, basically valuing an affordable housing supply over the ability to make maximum profit through real estate. Mm. And, and generally, I think the whole concept of, you know, rent seeking in Canada, where people are trying to basically make money by being a middleman rather than uh, than uh, doing something productive, whether it's through real estate or something else, like that seems to be people's main business plan. And then beyond that, I think um, we need to have 
you know, maybe it's, it's really hard to change people's minds when they're very entrenched in their way and in the, you know, the character of the neighborhood you want to see. But um, what I was getting at with the, the Calgary hearing is the opposition to this very moderate form of rezoning is extremely fierce from a lot of people wow. who basically bought a place and they're now coming to council to say, you know, I bought my home 40 years ago or I bought it 10 years ago or even, you know, a few years ago, but I bought into this, uh, you know, neighborhood. Lifestyle. Yeah, I bought into a neighborhood that was zoned a certain way and I feel like that should be honored or whatever. But I, at the same time, I think living in a city um is you're kind of making the choice to be exposed to change in one way or another. Yeah. Um, like you can say higher density is the change you have to see. Right. But I think the fundamental thing is that there is going to be change. And if you hold up something like, you know, very moderate levels of densification, you're going to see change in other ways. It's just instead mm -hmm. of an increase in density, you're going to see it as an increase in homelessness or an increase in, you know, seniors on fixed income having to choose between making, their rent payments or buying groceries or a change in your friends having to move out of the neighborhood because their landlord decided to sell the place and they can't afford anywhere new to rent in the same area. Mm. Um, you're, you're going to see change one way or the other when you're living close to a lot of people. And you, I think, have to accept that the change will happen and direct your efforts into putting into the best change that you can choose. And I think fundamentally, if you are living in a city around other people, you have to take other people into consideration when you're making that choice. Um, so I, yeah, I, th I think just a more general acceptance of different housing forms and more density is something that we need to see uh, from a cultural level. I think um, both culturally and from a regulatory perspective, we're doing a lot of things as though we're still in a situation where we have a great surplus of housing. I know, um, yeah as opposed to being in quite a critical deficit. Mm. Yeah. And I, you know, to stand on this, like we, we talk about different groups, you know, boomers have their heart set on being able to sell that property they bought in 1985 or 1995 for three, four times what they bought it for. But I think as you spelled it out, if we don't, if we don't break their hearts here, then we're going to have to continue to accept the fact that more of our friends are going to be unhoused and more tents are going to be in our streets and more seniors are going to be in food bank lines. And, and that's, that's, I think the question, like you say, is missing from those conversations in Calgary, or maybe they're not missing. I'm not paying attention like you are, but to these NIMBYs who believe they bought their neighborhood when they bought their house, um, I think that seems like it's missing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sir, I, uh, we're at 57, so we got to wrap it up, but I, yeah, man, it's like, we could talk for another hour. I know I'm oh, really yeah, happy no that, yeah, I'm really happy that you, you spent the time here just to chat with us and, and yeah, just talk through some of these, uh, developments that are happening at the federal level and how they're trickling down differently and different experiences. And, um, and I think we'll have to follow up with you when this affordable housing plan in Calgary finishes up, do we know when that's going to be? Uh, the <laughs> current, this is kind of the first major element they're implementing, but it's also the most controversial. Yeah, I think they have something like it's it's going to be like a ten day public hearing on just this okay. single item of upzoning, but it's one part of a many multi part plan, so it's probably going to be more than a year until right. the whole thing wraps. Uh, and then you know, there's implementation. It's it's sure. you know, trying to get major changes like this implemented and actually having positive things happen it's it's a long-term process and it's also an everyday process right it's, yeah you can celebrate each little win but you know the, the day after that happens you have to show up again and keep Ask pressing for more. forward otherwise <laughs> it's just going to stagnate and you know over the past 50 years we really did not keep pushing forward 